What I wanted to talk about was management of the OAB patient and use insights from my 20 years of clinical experience. When I first talk to residents, when I introduce neurology and voiding dysfunction, I often describe the urinary tract function as having uh, two roles, storage and emptying. And for 99% of the time, the bladder's in a storage mode. It's filling and it's uh, quietly filling at low pressures. And then for the few times during the day when it's safe and socially appropriate, it's like a switch gets flipped and the bladder goes to a voiding mode. It empties completely and then goes back to a storage mode. So this is a simplistic way of thinking about urinary tract function. It's obviously more complex than that. The bladder is innervated by both somatic and autonomic pathways, and it, it really requires integration cent centrally to function. It's different than other visceral systems like the GI system in the sense that if you cut the central connectivity, the bladder doesn't function. It becomes areflexic or underactive or flaccid. That's different from the GI system which can still function if you do a vagotomy. The, the GI system has intrinsic innovation and peristalsis can occur. But the first lesson that I want to talk about is it's not that deep. And what I mean is I want to focus on the two ends of the pathway, both the brain and the bladder, because I think this is where a lot of the action is occurring and where I think a lot of our future therapies can be targeted. When we think about the brain, a lot of the functional MRI studies have really shed light on important supraspinal centers that control micturition and that the changes that are associated with development of overactive bladder and aging. Some of these areas are designated as the bladder brain control network, and I want to highlight some of these areas. The right anterior insula, right insula, is, uh, functions as an area that maps visceral signals, particularly nociceptive inputs and it allows them to become conscious. This is an area that's activated during bladder filling, and it's been shown to be more active in overactive bladder patients than controls. The anterior cingulate gyrus, or ACC, is another area that's identified during bladder filling. It uh, allows for the awareness of bladder fullness and a desire to void, and when activated, it induces pelvic, pelvic floor muscle contractions and healthy controls. It's another area that's activated during bladder filling, and both the insula and the ACC are duly activated during filling. However, studies have found that in OAB patients, new connections are established with these accessory temporal regions in order to maintain bladder control. The prefrontal cortex, or PFC, is an area that receives input from the right insula, but it really in, is, is, uh, inhibits the micturition reflex via activation of, of the PAG, or periaqueductal gray. And finally, the SMA, or supplementary motor areas, are regions that are a pelvic floor muscle contraction center. It's kind of a backup mechanism for continence, and it's duly activated with the ACC regions. So this bladder brain control network is very dynamic. It, it uh, varies with age and can be influenced by several factors, including psychological components, structural changes, and with more advanced disease, even treatment. Studies have, studies have shown that patients with overactive bladder and detrusor overactivity have increased activation of areas like the ACC and SMA regions, which means there's an increase in pelvic floor muscle contraction to counteract sensations of urgency. However, they can't maintain continence because the prefrontal cortex is, is dysfunctional, and this normally inhibits the micturition reflex. It's not that deep when we consider other areas like the urothelial, urothelial lining of the bladder. Traditionally thought of as a waterproof layer, we now know that this layer is not a passive bystander. It's actually the most metabolically active layer within the bladder. It can respond to stretch by releasing transmitters such as ATP and acetylcholine, which can exert an autocrine effect within the urothelium itself. It can also activate sensory nerves and interstitial cells within the suburothelium and even activate the detrusor muscle itself. Dr. Kara will like this, but our lab has done studies when he was a resident showing that ATP release is increased in spinal cord injured bladders and that we can reduce the rate of release with treatment with botulinum toxin. Other studies looking at differential gene expression between overactive bladder and normal tissues have shown a significant interaction between the TRIP receptors and the purinergic receptors suggesting that these may be ideal targets that can disrupt overactive, overactive bladder activity. All in all, 
The urothelium is ideally suited because of ease of access via intravesical means to deliver potential therapies, whether that be gene therapy or even botulinum toxin. Lesson two, it's not always black and white. Don't forget the gray areas. Benign urology has many conditions that are traditionally thought of as being mutually exclusive. I see an overactive bladder are two of those conditions. <clears throat> well, if one, consider, one may consider these on opposite ends of the same spectrum, or some may consider them as conditions with different mechanisms. But generally, you don't see these conditions together. What I would say is that's not necessarily true in all cases. I do have patients with, IC, with interstitial cystitis that also have urge incontinence. I also have patients with OAB or neurogenic bladder that can develop IC or bladder pain syndrome. It may sound like an oxymoron that a patient would have overactive bladder and underactive bladder, but it's a true phenomenon. These are patients that we've in the past designated as having DHIC or detrusor hyperreflexia with impaired contractility. Whether we diagnose these patients clinically or urodynamically, they may be more bothered by the overactive bladder symptoms, but the underactive bladder symptoms may be, have a greater impact on our choice of treatment. Now, what about IC versus UTI? Now, Medicare doesn't allow a dual diagnosis, and we know that, ICC is, that IC is a diagnosis of exclusion, but does that mean that a patient with IC can't have a UTI? Well, that's not true. Right? And I think that patients with IC, the more attuned they are with their underlying condition, the more readily they can differentiate whether they have an IC flare or a true UTI. Multiple studies have implicated UTI in the pathogenesis of OAB, particularly in a subset of patients who are refractory to standard therapy. It's thought that the uropathogenic E. coli invade the urothelium during colonization evoke an inflammatory response, and recruit and activate immune cells. They can also localize within the ure urothelium, forming intracellular bacteria colonies, which can evade the immune response. The body responds by shedding urothelium, which increases urothelial permeability and allows the urinary metabolites and bacteria toxins to access the bladder interstitial, cell, interstitial tissues. This leads to hypersensitization of sensory nerves and activation of these uh, sensory pathways leading to the overactive bladder symptoms we see, frequency, urgency, and nocturia. In fact, a study showed that patients who received six weeks of antibiotic treatment and OAB treatment had a greater reduction in, in, in OAB symptoms compared to the patients that received OAB medications alone. These same patients also showed a reduction in pro-inflammatory cytokines and a reduction in the bacteria within the urothelial cell layer. The etiology of OAB contains multiple phenotypes. One includes the association between metabolic syndrome and overactive bladder. Both these conditions have overlapping contributors, including afferent nerve dysfunction, chronic ischemia, dysregulation of nutrient sensing pathways, and dysbiosis. Epidemiological studies have shown that patients with severe LUTs have an increased risk of severe adverse cardiovascular events. Female OAB patients have been shown to have higher insulin levels and increased insulin res resistance compared to controls. And finally, the composition of the urinary microbiome can have both protective and pathological effects on underlying urothelium and modulating bladder function. For example, Studies have shown that patients with urinary urge incontinence have higher levels of Gardnerella and decreased levels of lactobacilli compared to controls. Studies have also shown a lack of diversity in the microbiome of patients with urinary urge incontinence, meaning that their bladder and vaginal floras overlap. So in the future, we may see a paradigm shift in the way we treat OAB patients depending on the uh, characteristic characterization of the underlying bladder phenotype. Unfortunately, we don't have sensitive enough biomarkers currently to, to really phenotype these patients. So lesson number three is see the forest through the trees. While I may focus on improving treatment, uh, what bothers the patient the most, focusing on OAB treatment, I'm not going to ignore promoting global bladder health and uh, addressing other factors that may impact their symptoms. So, all these patients, I'm going to look at, uh, discuss bladder irritants. I'm going to also talk about UTI prevention strategies. And I'm also going to address underactive bladder 
if signs or symptoms are present, as well as addressing other factors that may impact their uh, treatment symptoms and outcome. These include metabolic syndrome, things like diabetes mellitus, and if they have GI or pelvic floor issues. Lesson number four, it's not what you say, but how you say it. Success of OAB treatment depends on a variety of factors, some of which are beyond our control, but some highlighted in red, which we can in influence. We know that with behavioral treatment, there's only a 32% success rate at one year. OAB meds only have a 15 to 40% adherence rate at one year, and only 5 to 10% of patients with OAB progress to more advanced treatment. So how can we improve that? Well, patient-centered care by eliciting patient goals, by establishing treatment plans with realistic expectations, and by tailoring treatment with shared decision-making can improve t uh, therapy adherence, optimize outcomes, and reduce healthcare expenditures. We also have to realize that the placebo and nocebo effect are real responses, and they're well established in benign urologic conditions like OAB. The uh, impact of these uh, factors can have a great impact on treatment outcome. So it's really important that as physicians we maximize the placebo effect by minimize and as well minimize the nocebo effect. How can we do that? Steps include identifying and describing the value of treatment plans and how they can benefit patients. It also involves using empathy and positive gestures and attitudes when we discuss patient care and reducing patient anxiety. If a patient has negative expectations of a treatment, encourage them to discuss treatment with other patients who have successfully treated with this therapy. There was a very famous Islamic physician called Avicenna who once said, often the confidence of the patient in his physician does more for the cure of the disease than the physician with all his remedies. Now I want to discuss, uh, this is a clinical study, a retrospective study of 11 centers who treated OAB patients the first time with onobotulinum toxin A, 100 units. And what they were focused on was the rates of incomplete emptying or UTIs. They looked at 48 males and 230 females, and what they found at six-month outcomes was a high rate of incomplete emptying. It's 20% overall, but it was 35% in males and 17% in females. The only uh, variable they found was a higher risk for incomplete emptying was male gender. The UTI risk is about 22%, which was equal between both males and females, and the only primary risk factor was prior his history of UTI. This was another study, a pooled analysis, looking at over 500 males treated with botulinum toxin A. 10 out of 12 studies use onobotulinum toxin with a varied dose of 100 to 300 units. The pooled analysis showed that the risk of, inc of uh, incomplete emptying and CIC was about 28% and the UTI risk was about 29%. So these studies both show a much higher risk of incomplete emptying uh, that we've found in prior randomized controlled trials. And I bring that up as lesson number five, that a step back may be the way forward. When I initially started my clinical practice, we used rigid cystoscopes within the clinic. So I would inject the trigone uh, to really target the sensory pathways and minimize the adverse events. Uh, we even did a study on that looking at a simplified injection technique with 10 injections within the bladder trigone and bladder floor, and we showed excellent results with minimal adverse effects. But as a clinic transitioned to a flexible cystoscope, I modified my template because it was hard to really access the trigone. So I did the uh, FDA-approved template of 20 injections of 0.5 mLs spread throughout the bladder. Over time, what I noticed that certain populations, males, Parkinson's patients, and even older OAB, OAB patients, I seem to have a higher risk of in, incomplete emptying, somewhat uh, like what these prior studies showed. So what I, what I did was I took a step back. I said, looked at some of the older publications we did, and I targeted the trigone again in some of these vulnerable populations, and I, I modified my technique. So you, with a flexible cystoscope, if you flip it 180 degrees, you can really flex the scope and have better access to the trigone and floor of the bladder, and I've uh, utilize these on my patients. You know, while I don't have any long-term results, I think that the, the uh, real important uh, message is that whatever you're doing treating a patient, if it's not working or you're having more adverse events, take a step back uh, and identify, you may identify new paths forward. In patients with refractory overactive bladder, this may involve using multiple third-line treatments. I have some patients that I've done sacral neuromodulation as well as Botox. It also may involve taking a step back and 
using an overactive bladder medicine, the patient may have be previously been unsuccessfully treated. If you add that in with the third line treatment, it may improve their treatment outcomes. And finally, the enemy of good is not always better. And what I mean by that is I often tell residents the enemy of good is better, meaning that trying to achieve a better or best or even perfect result may be the enemy of good if the increasing efforts lead to diminishing gains. But that's not always the case. Sometimes a little increased effort can lead to vastly improved clinical results. And that's what I want to show in this example here with sacral neuromodulation. Here you can see we place the electrode very medially within the uh, left S3 foramen. We have a nice angle laterally uh, through the S3 foramen. We stimulated the patient and had good bell's response at low intensity, but didn't have any toe flexion. So at this point, we could stop, place the lead, and you know, be satisfied with the results. We wanted to get a better result to try to uh, really access motor uh, sensation, motor or contraction of the toes as well. So we placed the next electrode more flat to try to ac access more S3 fibers. A small change in placement led to much greater results. The patient had much better toe flexion, uh, had actually Bella's response and toe flexion at low intensities. So we, we placed the electrode, we placed the trocar just to the anterior, anterior board of the sacrum. And you can see we have a nice medial lateral angulation of the lead. Once again, we could stop here and end the procedure, but on lateral view, we could see that the lead appeared to migrate uh, more posteriorly. And uh, I think what happened, the trocar got pulled back and the lead made a false passage. So we actually removed the lead, placed the uh, uh, needle again, and repassed the electrode. And now we have proper configuration where the electrode is in a posterior direction. The number three electrode is just uh, along the anterior board of the sacrum. We have a nice medial and lateral trajectory of the electrode. And you can see when we test all four electrodes, you can see we uh, bellows response at very low intensities. But not only that, when we move to the feet and test, we also have toe flexion at, at very low intensities as well. And getting this motor response at low intensities, both bellow and toes, um, really optimizes the patient to get the best uh, outcome with the therapy. So just uh, in some cases, uh, you know, small adjustments, taking a little extra time can lead to a, a better result. So in conclusion, with overactive bladder, over time I've learned it's not that deep. Really focus on the ends of the pathways, the bladder and the urethelium. It's not always black and white. Don't forget the gray areas. A lot of these patients have multiple conditions. It's not, they're not always mutually exclusive one another. See the forest through the trees. We want to focus on treating what bothers the patient most, but don't ignore these other symptoms that can have an impact on the treatment. So let's promote uh, global bladder health as well as discuss other uh, factors, the GI issues, pelvic floor issues, metabolic issues that could impact their uh, 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 symptoms and treatment outcomes. It's not what you say, but how you say it, right? It, using uh, uh, empathy, patient-centered care, and really uh, recognizing the placebo and nocebo effects and, and how, that can hap uh, how that can affect treatment. It really describes the art of medicine. A step back may be the way forward, right? If things aren't working or you're having adverse, ex uh, adverse events, take a step back, maybe alter what you're doing, and, and it could lead to better results. And finally, the enemy of good is not always better. Sometimes, you know, taking a little, uh, making a little extra effort can have uh, great effects. This is uh, one other example of, of see the forest through the trees. Uh, recently, me and my wife climbed Wheelers Peak, which is just outside Taos. It's the highest point within New Mexico. So once again, I want to thank you guys for your attention.